or mm, I don't have the choice. I think Daniela set it up as a, as a whatever. It's not a problem. I can record. Okay, that will be part of our recording this minor discussion between us. So we go off camera and then in one minute uh, I open the the room. Just uh, know that we have eight people in the breakout room. So still a very small number of attendees at the moment. So we are going off camera. When do we come on camera? You know, I mean, I, I was talking about uh, the synergy team. I think you can, uh, I don't know, up to you. Um, Eli, what do you suggest? Yeah. Thank no, I think talking. Rebecca, Neil, and Allison, you stay on camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. And certainly, Rebecca, as people are joining as well, too, feel free to, you know, have some very light dialogue just so people recognize that we're almost starting. People are welcoming. Uh, it's a little bit different than we've done the Zoom webinar previously with a pee off. So feel free to interact as you like. But uh, any final questions? Yes. Um, Rebecca, what's my final transition sentence to you before so you know that I'm handing it over? I think, Allison, you could just say that's the example of global skin, and I'm going to turn it back to Rebecca now, who will guide us through the setting up the, the co-creation, and everybody can roll up their sleeves and, and contribute to this. Thank you. Fabulous. Thanks, everybody. Best of luck. We'll check on the other side. Neil's got a question. Or are you saying time? No, sorry. Is it the Q&A or the chat that we look at? What do we look at on this setup? When people uh, pose a question... Where does it appear? It, that will depend on how people want to put it. It could go in the chat or the Q&A. Okay, fine. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Look at all of these folks joining our discussion today. Super excited. I see a lot of names. Feel free to turn cameras on if you like. Oh, popping up. I see some friendly faces. That's good. And Marie, hello. Robert, Hi. nice to see you. Kate, how do you? Hey, hey. <laughs> It's good. Great to have everybody coming in. We're going to give just a minute or two, allow other colleagues to join us today. Great to have everyone with us here as we're rounding out the year. Hopefully everyone is looking forward to uh, good holidays. Mm-hmm. Yes, one day she was calling me Mona, and I was like, what? Mona? Yeah, because it's with the... Okay, looks like, wow, look at all the people coming on. I am super excited. We have uh, a lot of interest in this session today, um, which means this is a really important topic for all of us. Certainly an important topic for us at PFMD, and so happy that everybody could uh, take some time to join and engage. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started to kick things off because we have a whole lot we want to discuss today. And you, as you know, if you've participated in these PF sessions, there's never enough time uh, for us, right, um, to come together as a community and share. So um, let me just say welcome. Welcome on behalf of all of my colleagues um, and the PFMD team, certainly delighted that you are with us today and able to connect for our time together. So we can begin to look ahead to our agenda. What is it that we're going to be exploring? Um, so first and foremost, I think an, a good appreciation of what we've actually accomplished. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to keep up with this space, there's been a lot going on. So we'll give a, a quick update on some collective accomplishments. We'll reflect on some of the trends that we see happening within the regulatory and health technology space. And then of course, we will spend some time co-creating together and really sharing some perspectives about the integration of patient engagement activities into uh, the PED processes. And what we envision then importantly 
for next year as we're coming back for the holidays for all of us to be thinking about where will we evolve and how can we continue to lean into these spaces. So good for you. It's not just me today, right? I have other colleagues joining me, um, and much more brilliant than I am. I really appreciate having Allison Fitzgerald from Global Skin and Neil Ber excuse me, Bertelson. Gosh, I've got a tickle in my throat. I'm <clears throat> sorry, Neil. Uh, with HTAI joining us. Well, I get the tickle out of my throat. I'm going to ask you, um, what are you, how are you feeling about the progress that we've made in this area as we think about the landscape for PE and PED in 2023? Oh, I can start with that one. I mean, I think we've made tremendous progress in getting PED on the landscape. And I think we'll talk about that and we'll see that through the presentations that we'll start this session off. Um, but it's on the landscape now. People are still grappling with what it means, um, but it's there. It's something that everyone's talking about, and that's a tremendous achievement. And I will add from the navigator and as we co-create the roadmap moving together, I'm, I'm excited to be able to use it to offer real world examples of how these are moving forward. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives. Really helpful just to be able to connect to you, to be able to appreciate where we are with things. Um, and so we can jump into our session. So as we go throughout um, the discussion today, Feel free to use the chat, uh, pop in any comments or questions uh, if you like, um, so that we can make sure we're engaging with you as an interactive experience. Love to see that. Hello, Load. Um, really uh, nice to see you. And I'm I'm in, I'm totally in, uh, intrigued by the AI assistance that's helping us take notes for this session. So it better be a really, really good session for us today as we're thinking about not only the future of PED, but the future of artificial intelligence and how we'll all be using this. Um, so let's get the ball rolling. Um, <clears throat> let's um, really start um, reflecting on how we're gonna use our time together today and jumping into a, a discussion around patient experience and the patient experience data integration. We'd love to step into this session really thinking about where you all are as you come into this space together. So what I'd like to do is if we go to the next slide, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to hear what does patient experience data mean to you? And if you can just pull up your phones, have them handy, pull them up, uh, pull up the Slido really, really quick and put in what one word, what one word comes to your mind when you think of patient experience data? Ooh, I think, I see we've got some people typing. Robust, ooh, look at this, meaningful. Absolutely, that one's like popping out big, bold, and strong. It is complex, I also acknowledge that, having been in this space. Matt has put a comment in the chat. If you're having trouble accessing it, feel free to uh, ch click on the uh, link. Insights. How can we do a better job really maximizing the insights that we're hearing from people and the patients around us? Essential. I love that one. I wish that was in the heads of all of my clinical development teams within the company, that this is an essential um, practice for us to be following. Meaningful still seems to be taking the, taking the lead, I will say, and the importance of relevance of making sure that that insight um, and the perspective from patients is meaningful, necessary, powerful. Love to see this. Long overdue. <laughs> excellent, excellent. 
We feel like we've gotten a pretty good representation. And let's just give 30 seconds or more for folks to be able to uh, type in your responses. I can see one person is still typing. Want to give space for that. We'll keep this. I think it's a really nice visual for us to use as reflect uh, for others as they're coming into this space, just to provide some perspective representative of the community that we have around us. Okay, I think we can officially close out. Thank you for sharing your input. Thank you for, um, you know, thinking of the words that are most relevant for our discussion today. And I, I'm going to take the word meaningful into our dialogue with the aspiration that how we use our time is a meaningful uh, time for you and that you are able to really reap the benefit and walk away from this session feeling really good and feeling some uh, learning something that you didn't know before as you're thinking about next year and how you would like to kick off your activities. So um, thank you for that um, and sharing your perspectives. We'll now um, roll into the next part as we give an overview. You know, I had shared with you at the beginning that I wanted to take a moment to kind of share an overview and set the frame, talk about some uh, of the accomplishments and where we're at. And as we set the frame for this, I think it's really relevant. I love this slide in that it helps set a foundation, a grounding for all of us. What is it really, what do we need when we talk about a patient experience data? Um, and, you know, that can be represented in a number of ways. And in the red box, you can see all of the various stakeholders that uh, we should be considering as we're generating this data. But at the heart of this, patient experience data is really about making sure we're prioritizing the areas and the impacts that are most meaningful to patients. Um, understanding the patient experience is absolutely essential and fundamental for a variety of healthcare decisions. Um, and when we're able to represent those patient experiences and those experiences that are most meaningful and impactful to patients, it's a matter then of how we contextualize and capture that through a variety of uh, formats. So really listening, engaging, understanding patients' experiences, and then thinking through how do we capture that? What needs to be measured? Uh, and how do we make sure that we're able to bring that to life and contextualize that information? Um, so this is, as you can see in the middle columns, can represent a lot of different things, as I've said. Symptoms that people are experiencing, the impact of the condition that on their quality of life, um, patient, you know, their preferences for what are the outcomes and the treatments that are most meaningful for them, and the relevant importance of uh, issues that patients are experiencing and how we quantify that. And so really being able to engage and listen, putting that into context and thinking then about how do we ensure we're interpreting that in a way that can be quantified and uh, measured, and then being able to take those conversations, as I highlighted previously, for all of those critical stakeholders that are represented in the red box. And the more we can do this upfront in our planning to be thoughtful as we're engaging with patients and thinking about data, who are those stakeholders and how should we be engaging with them to make sure that data and information is received and accepted in the way in which we would like on behalf of patients. So if we move ahead, I think the most important point, and you've heard me kind of touch on this a bit, but I really, really want to emphasize our approach as you go through this process, it cannot happen without having patients directly involved. Patient experience is absolutely essential and at the core of this. There's lots of data and information resources that we can tap into these days, which is, is uh, wonderful. But if we're not engaging with patients directly and really hearing from them, we're missing a very important element. So those patient experiences are the invisible building blocks. You could think about them in that way for um, the patient experience data, the data itself to be able to come uh, to life. Um, and they are really important, no matter which methods are used to collect that data, that we're able to hear, understand, and really prioritize 
what is most important and relevant to patients as we go through this process of data generation. Now, luckily uh, for all of us, as we begin thinking about this process and, oh gosh, how can we collect this? How are we going to capture it? Um, how will we consider measuring this information? It's okay because the uh, luckily the PED suite of tools that is available for us is um, really helpful. So this is a summary slide just representing all of the various tools and frameworks that are available for you that really help to clarify how to integrate and streamline the processes that you're using to um, collect patient experience data while you're engaging with patients. So you can see this, what this really highlights is a multi-stake or collaborative um, of resources that can be used. And you can uh, first start with some of the reflection papers that have been um, uh, created that really represent what is the collective value of patient e experience data. If you're needing to engage with the stakeholders, you can see the navigator, which is first and foremost, the tool I think of real importance. Uh, for us to be utilizing and thinking about how the navigator comes together. Wait, go back one more slide. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, working through the navigator in the various fa phases of this, um, utilize the resources that are available to really highlight that. Um, and so you, you use the PE and PED roadmap, uh, which we're going to be developing. You are going to be giving input um, uh, today, which is really uh, valuable. And we'll highlight, uh, importantly, some of the movement that's happening in this area globally. So now we go to the next slide, just so you can reference as these tools and frameworks have been put together. It, this is really a snapshot of all of the organizations that have been involved um, and all of the individuals who have contributed this. And so I, I would just share from my perspective we have taken this approach and this methodology in the practices that we've used in some of our programs. And most importantly, working with patients directly, we've been able to integrate their input into how we think about outcome measures and endpoints for our clinical trials and pro uh, programs that wouldn't have already existed. So one of the examples that we highlight quite a bit is one of our a real shining stars within the organization is in the area of SMA, where we listening and engaging with the patient community. What we realized is certainly there are very important clinical indicators, but what patients uh, and their caregivers really care about is their independence. And through, through the input that we were able to collect in defining an endpoint that would be meaningful and then developing an independent scale with the patient community that is now accepted and utilized in clinical practice that shows the actual uh, impact of therapies for patients. Uh, can they set up, can they be more independent in their daily life, which is what really matters to them at the end of the day. So um, that's a, just a brief highlight of an example to share with you of the power of how these tools can help in framing your contributions as you work with patients directly. So now I'd like to progress and move us forward into an important topic around health ne technology and how we can consider assessing the landscape and navigating the trends and changes that are happening in this area as well. So Neil, I give the floor to you. Thank you so much. And you know, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because you gave that really, Excellent example, Rebecca. Uh, I'm really showing the power of, of patient engagement as well as patient experience data. And it's those things coming together that are really going to make the difference. But it's no good if we're the only people saying this and we're the only people doing this. We have a nice time on this, on this particular payoff, but the world outside will not change. <clears throat> um, but the world outside is changing. If you go into the next slide, you can really see that there's been an upward swing, an acceleration of different kinds of organizations, decision makers such as regulators, HCA bodies, healthcare systems, all thinking about both patient engagement and patient experience data. We have an avalanche of guidance reflection papers that are coming at us at the moment where different kinds of organizations are thinking what it means to them. And we wanted to capture that 
in a landscape paper that would be peer reviewed. And we, we had this published earlier this year. So if you go on to the next slide, I just want to talk about that landscape paper. Because what we were trying to do was we could hear all this noise in the environment, talking about patient engagement, patient experience data. And so we wanted to really look and see, well, what's really happening? outside of PIOF, outside of the PIOF community, across the world, across different stakeholder groups, with a focus on thinking, what are the regulators doing? What are the HTAs doing? And that's the landscape paper that was published earlier this year, which really shows the different guidances, um, the different reports, the different reflection papers that are coming out of various institutions across the world. And we found 53 um, different pieces of information. And you can see from the first of these pie charts that the geographic scope here, it's still Europe, North America, global. We've seen a rise in this kind of reporting and thinking coming from um, Asia. Uh, we're seeing a lot of work in the UK from different institutions looking at how they think about patient engagement and patient experience data. But what I want to focus on is the right-hand pie chart, because I think that shows both the opportunity and the challenge that we have going forward. When you dig down into what these people are talking about in their guidances and documentations, nearly half are talking about patient engagement in isolation. They're talking about, we need to do good patient engagement, this is what it looks like. There are some that are talking about patient experience data, that's the green slice of that pie chart. And they're saying, yep, yeah, what is patient experience data? How should we be thinking about patient experience data? They're all great things. What we want to see is actually the red slice of that pie chart getting much, much bigger. Because that red slice that's, that's just six items that we found, where those documents talk about the integration of patient engagement with patient experience data. And as Rebecca said, you know, we need those things together. They don't work if we separate them. And so we're looking to grow that red slice of that pie and make it much, much bigger. That should be more than half of that going forward in an ideal world. And if you go on to the next slide, I'm going to give you a sense of the kinds of things that we found here. And you can see it's global. It doesn't cover every single country, but you can see it covers lots of different um, uh, impacts of patient involvement. It talks about guidance on patient participation. There's so much richness in each of these documents and guidance and papers that we found. And I can't emphasize enough, if you've not seen the paper and you want to find out more about these guidances, there's links to them all in the paper. It's an open access paper, um, so it's freely available and the link um, is now in the chat. So if any of these catch your eye and you think, I need to know more about what they're saying, just follow the link and go to it. and You'll get those details there. But what did we learn? What kinds of questions came out of this? If we go on to the next slide, I think, we saw that, yes, this is a rapidly increasing landscape. There's a lot of interest in PE. There's a lot of interest in patient experience data. So the guidance is coming, showing that interest. But we need that to be deeper. And we need it particularly to start thinking about patient engagement as a natural part of the process of patient experience data and patient experience data as a natural output or natural companion to patient engagement. So the two things are joined um, completely together. So we really need to be focusing on this necessity of integrating patient engagement in the design, in the interpretation of patient experience data. That's the only way that it's going to work successfully. And so where we're heading to is a co-creative framework that really looks at these elements and pulls them together in a way that shows that it works much, much better when we have this sort of tight integration of the two. If you go on to the next slide. So I 
I really want to remind you, Rebecca mentioned this, that we have lots of tools. I uh, really want to remind you that the PED Navigator is the first step in this whole process we've just been talking about. It's a great tool for thinking about patient experience data, and it helps you answer questions like, you know, what, how do you determine what is important to patients? You know, it talks about the methodologies, how you start thinking about collecting patient experience data with other, other elements about you know, which, which stakeholders you use it, when do you use it, and why do you use it, um, and so that we can start to build that rounded picture of patient experience data. But this tool looks at patient experience data in isolation at the moment, and that's what we need to move on from. And so um, if you just move on to the last slide that I, I will present, um, this is the process that we're thinking about and it's what we're going to be working through um, today in this session. We have the Global Ped Navigator, which answers those basic questions and gives us some thinking about patient experience data. But what we need to think about is how we integrate patient engagement within the process of developing patient experience data. So what do we do in terms of patient engagement around the design and planning? around the generation of patient experience data through to the analysis and interpretation, which is just as important, and the communication and use of that data. And today we'll be taking you through that process and we'll be having a working session to think about how patient engagement can work in those early stages of generating uh, patient experience data. But before we get to there, I'm really pleased to pass the baton over to Alison, who's gonna give us a concrete example over to you, Alison. Thanks, Neil. I'm excited to follow that. Um, so I am the project manager for a project that is called GRID. And I'm going to explain it because the, the word GRID will come up. It's Global Research on the Impact of Dermatology Disease. So I am the project manager at Global Skin, which is a patient organization alliance of um, patient organizations from around the world representing skin. And it was founded back in 2015 um, at the World Congress of Dermatology, which just happened to be in Canada that year. And it became very clear back then that there was a gap um, with respect to skin. And the gap was in the patient voice and the patients weren't feeling heard. And it wasn't that they were feeling not feeling heard when it came to the skin themselves itself, but they weren't feeling heard in terms of the impact that their dermatological disease was having. So it very quickly came to be that the burden of the disease is severely underestimated, not just nationally and by institutions, but at the global level. It is very under-resourced because as we know, patient organizations aren't usually the most resourced uh, organizations and it's underestimated. The impact of having skin disease is severely underestimated. So it came together and one of the founding mandates of Global Skin is that the patients needed to find their voice and how to have that voice elevated. So what Global Skin decided to do was work with a patient advocacy group, as well as with researchers, to figure out how to elevate this voice, how to take these individual stories and these, these bits of, of data that exist either per disease or per country and bring it together to, to create a stronger collective voice. At the same time, they also realized that this data wasn't necessarily based on rubrics created by patients themselves um, or data that was created by a patient-led measure. And so as they looked to put together a survey that would gather this important impact data, they realized that there wasn't a survey or a PROM, which is called a measure that was actually created by patients to evaluate patient impact. And so Global Skin took on the idea of creating a new patient-led measure that measures the impact of dermatology disease. And unfortunately, at this time, the navigator didn't exist. So working with researchers and patient organizations, um, we developed a methodology in terms of how to create a patient-led measure. And as we've seen over the last few years, the importance of patient-led initiatives, especially most recently by the FDA, 
is, is quite is quite strong. So we said, what if we could use this patient-led measure to create a credible patient voice that's built on verifiable data and that policymakers wouldn't ever have to make a decision without including a patient-led measure again. So it was very exciting and we took it on. And in the next slide, I'll share a bit of how we fused gathering patient experience data with patient engagement. So oftentimes in measures, doctors will take the idea, here's what we think is important for patients and that we should measure. But what we did instead was we created workshops and did patient interviews and asked them, what is important to you when it comes to the burden of living with skin disease? And we had 263 unique items from around the world about what they felt was the most important burdensome to them. Then again, at the next stage, we took those 263 items and usually at this stage, um, a researcher or somebody in the medical field will say, well, we think that these are the most important items to measure. But what we did instead was we went back to the patients and we said, you tell us what are the most important things to measure when it comes to your impact and your burden. And so over the pandemic, we sent out a survey globally, 1,100 patients, 61 countries, 90 diseases. And you said, you tell us what's the most important thing when it comes to impact. So they did. And we got it down to 27 items that crossed country and crossed disease. Then we went back to them and said, are you sure? We really want to talk to you. You tell us what it is. Did we hit the mark? Are we missing something? And so again, we talked to 12 patients in four countries and six diseases and just just double checked, had the patients tell us, did we hit the mark or are we missing something? And it was great, we got it down to 26 items. And then if you truly want a valid patient measure, you do have to do the analytics. And so that's where we got into psychometric surveys. But again, the surveys were done by the patients. So survey one sent out to 486 patients, can't be more than that because rash analysis has a cap on it. Survey two, again, to 500 patients to say, are you sure we need this? We need to double check the data. And so it came back that we got a, a measure truly created by patients for the patients and what they perceive to be the most important thing when you're talking about burden and impact. And just a quick aside, um, the most important to thing to them is not the physical part. The most important to that thing to them is the psychosocial. So they came back to us and over 50% of the items on this quality of life are psychosocial, which was really, really interesting and not at all surprising. And then finally, the patient said to us, well, we wanna use it and we wanna use it a lot of different ways. And that's where we are now. And we're so pleased that the navigator is out there for us to start working directly with PFMD and directly with the navigator to say, okay, for these next steps, we've launched a grid study, we've launched our measure, we're, we're getting patient data. We're getting patient data, not just with our measure, but we're using other measures because if we wanna use our measure in isolation, we have to compare it to the other measures that are already out there and map them together to say, you know what, ours is better. It wasn't just created by patients, but it truly measures what patients are telling you is important. And this measure doesn't do it so much. So, so we have to do a lot of the background research work to be able to provide the patients what it is that they would like to use and need to use to get their voice out there. So that's where we're at with the GRID study where we've launched it. We're hoping to get as many as 4,000 people participating from around the world. We have almost 100 countries and 4,000 people involved. And the next steps that we're looking at is what do patients want us to analyze with that data and how would they like us to share it? So are, there are some things that we're gonna have to do. We have to publish on it if you want to use a measure it has to be published. If you want FDA approval or for it to use in clinical trials or by industry or by payers, it has to be an evidence-based process. But patients are gonna help us figure that out. And they're also gonna tell us, look, we give you the data, here's how we would like it shared back with us. So we'll be working in combination with research, researchers and patients to say, is this valid data that we can share or is it not quite valid? How can we do it differently? How can we analyze it differently? What can patients use? What is useful? So we're gonna be looking very closely with the navigator as well as with the new roadmap that's coming up in terms of how to um, involve patients in this process yet also keep it as evidence-based and valid as possible. So the end result is 
is something that can be used by everybody, by industry, by payers, by decision makers, by patient organizations. It can be used at the WHO when we go for a UN resolution. There's a lot of places we can do it. So we're doing it in combination with, with everybody. So, so pleased to be with PFMD and working on that together. So I'll hand it over to uh, Rebecca on more of the co-creation of how this process works. Thanks. Allison, this has been such a great example. Thank you so much. And I'm just uh, enjoying the chat. There's been a couple of questions. So I do want to take uh, just a um, couple of minutes um, okay. so that we can answer a couple of the questions. One of them was, um, how did you find the right groups to collaborate with? And how did you send the surveys out? So we found the right groups because they were patient organization members of our. So we have over 130 initially back when it started. And we're up to almost 250 patient organizations that are members with us. Some are very under-resourced and very small. Some are very professional and very large, but they've all been willing to participate and put it out on their social media. So even though we only have patient organizations in 60 countries, we have almost 100 countries participating because they know how to get the word out to their, to their um, disease areas. So it's sort of been a two-step process through our patient organizations out into their communities. That's how we got it. I don't remember the second half of that question. No, you, you answered um, both okay. questions. You did a really nice job. I was just dovetailing them together. And, and I think you've almost uh, addressed one of the other questions, which is, you know, um, how do you ensure that you're mitigating bias uh, from having the same usual sp suspects, right, involved in giving uh, input into these? And I heard it was a pretty broad outreach of people collaborating, right? Yeah. And um, I think there's a, a minimum mass where you eliminate that bias. And so we always had a minimum that had to be reached in every step of the way. And it was usually an N equals 250. So as long as we at least did better than the minimum, and we always did, that reduced the bias significantly. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Again, a really, really great example to share with everyone. So thanks for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, as we begin to transition, you know, I had mentioned to you, um, we want to make sure we're spending some time together, uh, getting your input as well. And so we will uh, transition into our breakouts. Um, so just uh, walk down the path that we've been on this morning. So you've heard a little bit about where we are in the development of the tools and frameworks and what we've achieved this year. You've heard great perspective from Neil of what are the trends and what's happening in the landscape. Uh, the coming to us and now this really fantastic example from Allison of how she has applied the tool. So now as we go into the breakout, um, it's really your opportunity to engage and share perspective um, with everyone. So we are going to use our time um, to really embark on a journey where uh, we can an unravel the connection between PE and PED planning generation and processes as Neil highlighted Right, it's been thinking about how patient experience is integrated into the PAD processes. And so the goal here is really to gather your insights on how to continue to shape uh, the PE and PED roadmap. So we're gonna allocate 30 minutes for this discussion. You can see some of the key questions um, that we're gonna ask before you even indicate the design and planning stage. What type of patient engagement activities are needed? How can patients further um, be engaged to design and plan the project out? And, um, and then as you've been through the planning exercise, what kind of patient engagement is needed for the next phase, the generation phase of gathering that uh, data and evidence? I really encourage you to stay and participate at the end. We will uh, be sharing recommendations so you'll get um, some perspectives from the group collectively that will be valuable for you. So let's go ahead and um, dive into our um, breakout groups. Each of you will be magically allocated into a breakout room. Uh, as I said, we're going to be using smaller groups so that we can really share perspectives collectively. Uh, and you'll see a, a link. Um, so I think behind the scenes, we will be magically transitioned. And if not, there'll be a link that you can click on. Um, well, we'll be magically transitioned into the rooms. And then there will be a link posted in the chat 
that will direct us all to a group map that we'll be using for the exercise today. Hello, hello. I hope you all had really great discussions as a part of your uh, breakouts. I know I certainly uh, enjoyed my discussion with my fellow colleagues around um, the three areas, thinking about planning, how we engage, and patient engagement in the next generation of uh, data collection. And so, um, yeah, show me a hand. Where were you? Thumbs up? Let's get a little... Uh, connectivity going here. That's great. Anybody have a bad experience? Anybody willing to share? Uh, no? All good? Okay. We're being very nice and kind. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm sure your uh, conversations were all really good because we come into the space, right, as people who are all uh, really passionate about this. And one of the things, you know, so if we could just kind of reflect a little bit on what we heard in some of the um, uh, in some of the discussions, you know, the importance of um, what you invest is what you get out in investing in uh, patient engagement and making sure that we're doing that in a meaningful way, not uh, halfway, uh, that we're thinking about um, how information can be shared and leveraged more broadly, especially as it relates to particular disease areas um, where we're all reaching out and seeking information and wanting that engagement with patient and acute immunities. But how do we make sure as we're collecting that and collecting importantly, the evidence um, that will be generated as a result that that is, um, collected in uh, a sustainable way, uh, can, that can be, you know, referenced by future stakeholders as well. Any other observations, Neil and Allison from the discussions that you had? Yeah, we had a really rich discussion. I mean, we've got a list as long as your arm for each of yeah. those three columns. So, so it's hard to pick some, uh, you know, the ones, the what, all of them. But the ones that stand out for me that, that really stuck in my head was in this pre phase, was real opportunity to understand what the patients you're wanting to engage with, what they need, what support they need. And we weren't just talking about education here, we were talking about how can they be supported. Do they know what the meetings are like, what the structures of the meetings are? Um, we talked about different back channels that have worked really well for other projects, like having a WhatsApp group just for the patient community that are involved. So they can say, hey, we didn't understand that, you know, where they're able to have a safe space that they can explore what the experience of the engagement is during the process. And that can be key issues can be fed up out of that, which I thought was really um, a really good approach. Alison, what about you? What did your group come up with? Definitely talked a little bit about that. We we really um, explored the idea of understanding why and what the purpose is before you even start. So really digging into to making sure that everybody's on the same page before you proceed and, and aligned. We also, we talked a bit about the feedback loops and I know that's come up in previous PIOS, but really ensuring strong feedback loops in many directions, not just back to the patients, but do we include industry in feedback loops? Do we include other stakeholders that have been, been a part of the process in various shapes and forms? And Haley, if I've missed one of the significant ones, please don't hesitate to add on. No, that was terrific, Allison. I think that was a, a great summary and some really interesting dialogue, particularly around while we are ensuring the importance of engaging the patient community in all of this, because clearly that's been our focus. This really does become a multi-stakeholder approach where you want to make sure that you're checking in um, with, with industry, what research has already been done, um, thinking about from an academic or from um, healthcare professionals and thinking about various societies, what work has already been done in those areas so that we're not duplicating efforts and we're being efficient with the resources that are put, being put towards this. And most importantly, I think, making sure that there's not undue burden on the patient community as well. So some really great discussion and I, I really appreciate everybody's input with that. So thank you. Yeah, see, we had some commonality across our topics as well. 
Um, you know, the importance of the feedback loops, making sure we're checking in with stakeholders before we progress to ensure that data and evidence is going to be accepted, that the measures that we're going to be using um, will be taken up by HTAs and uh, regulators, and the importance of um, just you know, not doing this in a tokenistic way of sending surveys and asking for input, but really being meaningful about how we engage patients and find the the right connection points uh, of most value to them. So thank you very much for summarizing that and everyone's participation in the discussion today um, uh, as a part of the breakout. Let's see, from here now, I think it's important for us as we move ahead and are thinking about um, how do we continue to shape, right? So um, given your input and the roadmap as we're building it out, and we begin thinking about what is it that we want to achieve in 2024 and where are we heading? Where do we see that shift? Um, I'd like to hear, Neil, from you a bit about how you see things evolving. Yeah, so I, I think it's an interesting one because I think we're at this inflection point at the moment where we've got a lot of interest in patient experience data. We have started to think through what that means, but we have at least from a decision maker perspective, we have few use cases yet. You know, we're still at this sort of baby step uh, way. What I think is happening, and we're gonna see much more of in 2024, is experience of actually using and interpreting patient experience data. So we've had a lot of talk over the last few years about generating it from different stakeholders groups. So all that generation is about to hit decision makers. We're going to start seeing how they use it, where it makes a difference when it doesn't make a difference. So I think we're going to have a much clearer idea by the end of 2024 of what's working well and what needs to be adjusted. So I think that's from the external perspective. When I think about this project of, of, of patient engagement and patient experience data, then I think we're definitely going to, with the rich input that we've had today is just one example, I think we're going to find a really compelling way of showing that patient engagement and patient experience data belong together. And this mm -hmm. is how you do it. And these are the things to watch out for. And these are the things to maximize. And these are the, you know, the, this is, we're gonna have a plan, which is the whole thing we're aiming towards with this roadmap. I think what we still need to work on, it's not all gonna be roses. I think along the way, there are going to be people who try to do patient experience data the wrong way and get disappointed. And I think we need to be aware that there, there always are those stories where things go wrong, where things are not as successful as, as originally planned. And we need to be there as a community. I don't just mean us in this room, but as a community, we need to be there to say, hey, that went wrong. But maybe in the future, if it's, in, if it's approached in this way, we could make sure that things like this don't happen again. Mm -hmm. So those are the sort of things I've been thinking about for 2024. And I think when we're when we're observing and learning from our experiences, as you've said, you know, there are things that will go wrong. There are experiences that we have that aren't going to feel right. And so, yeah. you know, us coming together as a community and sharing that one of the conversations that we had in our group was just from an HTA perspective. Right. Um, you know, sometimes HTAs will want to gather patient feedback or input. So they send out surveys, right? Um, and to kind of check box here, we've got uh, input from patients and we're going to send a survey. Well, how do you know who's really responding to that? Doesn't give an opportunity really for patient groups or communities to be a part of the evidence generation that would be important. And so I think, you know, shifting away, as you've said, looking at the future where the quality and value of this data and information coming to stakeholders to really appreciate the difference, right? Um, in the in the quality and the ability to make the best decisions for patients, you know, interested in your perspective about that as well. I think I think we can look back in time actually and see how this goes if we're not careful. So so I think as as we think back to when patient reported outcomes became popular many years ago yeah. now, 
And but what I, happened? I would like to discuss them with, with, with you to see uh -oh. how do we want to Can get you it. mute, please? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Don't know who that you was. You were saying. <laughs> <laughs> but when we look at how, when patient reported outcomes started to get a lot of use, um, quite quickly, uh, research communities started building new patient reported outcomes. And we know when we look back at that time, that a lot of them were built without any patient engagement, which is why we have a big push now from the patient community to say we need new patient reported outcome measures that really capture what we're doing. We don't want to fall into that trap with patient experience data, which is why we need to do this from the beginning. And I think, as you quite rightly say, when HTA bodies and others start to get this data, they also do patient engagement alongside the data, most of them. So they speak to the patient community and they say, tell us what's important to you. And then they get this data coming in and they go, oh, that's great because actually it matches what we hear from the patient community. Or they say, oh my God, what is this? Where did this come from? It has nothing at all to do with what we hear from the patient community. And so I think we're going to see both examples over the next year. Very interesting. It will be certainly um, interesting to, for us to watch how this evolves and the landscape, right, as we le lean into as a community doing this together uh, with patients, making sure we're partnering um, together as a community and really leaning into the space and then seeing, just as you've said, how this landscape evolves, right? Um, and what the experiences that stakeholders have as they are getting input and, and looking at the data um, when it's um, when it comes together right in the right way. You know, there, there, it's always, I guess, uh, where my head is going. It's It always gets a little bit messy before it, uh, you know, exactly. as you said, can really come together, which is a really, exactly. really important point, I think, for us to appreciate. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing some reflections on, you know, where we're heading um, and where some of the future trends are. Um, any other perspectives that anyone would like to share before we? I just want to answer Kyle's question in the chat. Um, ah, Kyle yes. ask, asks about, you know, disease areas which will be emerging. I think, and I'm already seeing that disease areas that naturally rely on patient reported outcomes. So things like dermatology actually or mental health, they're likely to be the ones that we first see a lot of patient experience data around. That's just my hunch. What I would like to see though, is I would like to see disease areas that are actually well characterized by my biomarkers and, uh, and surrogate endpoints, those kinds of disease areas that we already have clinical markers for, I would love to see patient experience data done for them because I think it's we need to see how changes in clinical outcomes actually affect patient experience. So that's what I want to see. Thank you. I'm so, I'm so glad that question was asked. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to add one thing to what Neil said, just from um, the experience we're going through, because I love what you refer to as mess. Mm -hmm. We're launching the measure this year. And one of the things we're running up against, and this is an awareness piece for all stakeholders is because so many patient report outcome measures exist, they're in use and they've been studied and published on, and there's a lot of data. So as we approach the stakeholders that we'd like to work with, um, they look at us and say, you know what, but we're already using the other one. We've got 20 years worth of data. Um, we already included in our clinical trials in our phase three and our phase four. We already know how to use it. It's already got its minimally important change. We're just going to stick with it because it's there. You know what? It's not broken. So there's some interesting lethargy because something already exists and it's not perfect, but it's got data and even though the data is not perfect, it's still there and to switch to something that's better is proving to be um, a really messy path. It's hard, right? It's hard, yeah. yeah. I, I'm so glad you shared that, Allison, and the experience now of really being able to move ahead with this. Thank yeah. you. So we have to really collectively say, is the data that we're working with the data that we want to be working with as a patient? Yeah. This is exactly, 
What I was thinking when Neil was talking about, yes, patient communities receiving a survey. Well, receive a survey, it's very, very different than shaping the survey, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously the questions, the way they're asked, what do they cover, actually yeah, can heavily influence the the results, the, the data that are then generated. And how do we ensure that we, we definitely include the lived experience of people actually living with these diseases and but also their caregivers, their loved mm -hmm. ones? How do we measure the family's impact and also the 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 the, fam the burden mm -hmm. of the caregivers, but also the burden of the current standard of care, which is something that is very often underestimated. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we can talk hours for this. I, I'm cautious of time. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and we just have a couple more minutes. Uh, I'm cognizant as that, uh, of that as well. Um, before we close out, I see a hand raised, though. Was it me, Rebecca? It's Christine. Yeah, Christine. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say we we recently launched a community needs assessment and we brought together different groups to put together that survey and had everyone. My only thing that I would say is we had too many cooks in the kitchen and not enough people that really knew what was necessary on the information. You know, we had groups questioning, why are we giving a zip code? And we shouldn't have to do that. And different. So I would say that pulling together the different groups to put them together, but keeping that limited to just a few that actually know the topics that you're trying to cover and how you would present it because it just, it went from maybe a week long survey that we could have put together to five months of debating like moot points that needed to be included. So I would just caution on, on that. Um, but I did want to ask if anyone, our survey got put out, our link somehow got shared and then spammed. And we had 1,500 responses come in overnight from bots. Um, and then we had to halt our whole survey. My question to you guys is, how are you getting surveys out to communities without the risk of them being you know, compromised by outside people? Does anyone have any thoughts? <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. Anybody with that experience? Yes. <laughs> and I, Christine, yeah, so I think, Allison, I don't think we'll have time today, but maybe you guys could connect, Kristen and yeah. Allison. Um, oh, yeah. Just to be, oh, I see somebody else's hand going up. <laughs> oh, wow. I, would 20, 24. I would love to connect and discuss this because we've actually built technology to do just that. So, completely compliance, end to end encrypted done patient-centric, caregiver-centric, the whole thing. We'd love to talk to you about that and learn from your experience as well. I think we've got our next PIOF session, one of our You're future right? discussions organized around how do we uh, focus on gathering uh, input and doing surveys in the right way. So really appreciate that. As we close out our time together, um, you know, really appreciating the discussion that we've had today. If you're interested in getting involved and helping to shape this landscape as we move forward, please, please, please do that. Uh, you see the scan, easy to scan, provide your email address and uh, we will certainly follow up with you so that you can continue your engagement with us and continue to build on the great work we are, um, the great work we're doing. So um, thank you for your engagement today. I really wish everyone a happy holidays. I wanna thank my co-hosts, Neil and Allison for the session today. Really appreciate everybody's perspective and active engagement. Thank you to the PFMD team. You guys are amazing. Happy holidays. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye. 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 Bye.